Welcome to the City Church Podcast. We hope that you will be abundantly blessed by this message. If you would like to find out more about the city, please log on to our website, www.thecity.sg. The title of my sermon this morning is to remain steadfast in times of shaking. You know, I'm, I'm really excited to preach the word. I mean, Pastor Dan was talking about all these crises that's been happening in the world, and we know that we are living in precarious times. Right, but how many of you know that we can put our faith on something that's unshakable? Yeah. And that's God. And today I'm just going to talk about what it means to put our faith on things that is unshakable, even in times of shaking, and it will cause our faith to remain steadfast amidst all things. Um, I know Andre in, two weeks ago talked about cultivating your faith. Right? How many of you remember the three E's that he put up? Right? Well, he's still put in Instagram story and all these kind of things, so he's getting media savvy. So he, he's talked about three E's, right? He talks about how we need to exercise our faith. He talked about how we need to engage in our faith. And he talked about how we need to expect. He talked about how we need to cultivate our faith. He also talked about how faith is something that's an ongoing process that we need to develop and strengthen, right? And so this morning, I just want to, with that thought, sort of carry forth from what he preached two weeks ago. There's a scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 that says this, Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. So Paul writes to the church of Corinth and says, hey guys, examine your faith. Right? There's this, this idea of where we need to check our faith every now and then. You see, there's this idea that you can be in the presence of God without the presence of God being in you. Right? Hold that thought, right? You can have an ex- amazing experience, whatever's happening on stage, that's provided for you, but you can prevent anything from entering your heart. Right? The same thing, you can be walking through your life completely held hostage by your giants, the mountains that you're facing, the challenges that you're going through, the valleys that you're going through, the shakings that you're going through, and you may have a faith, but you may not necessarily be walking in faith. Make sense? So we can have a faith, but we may not necessarily be walking in faith. So what happens is when shaking happens, we get wavered because we are not walking in faith. And this is something that I want to address today. And there's a thought that I want to throw out today, that our faith can diminish, right? So much so that we don't even realize that there's a diminishing capacity to believe for God's kingdom to break in to the earth and into our lives, right? There's a diminishing capacity of our faith. There's a scripture in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 and 8. It says this, for every reason, make every effort. Make every effort. effort. In other um, versions, you see, have diligence. Make every effort to add to your faith. So or Peter says, add to your faith, right? There is an effort that we need to exercise to add to our faith. He talks about goodness, knowledge, self-control, self-perseverance, godliness, um, brotherly love, and love. And he says this, if you possess these qualities in increasing, everyone says increasing. increasing. If we have these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep us from being ineffective and unproductive in the knowledge of your Lord Jesus Christ. Which also means this, If you and I do not exercise our faith and make every effort to add to our faith, it also means that we will be ineffective and unproductive in knowing who God is. So there is a diminishing capacity to faith. It means that if you and I do not exercise in faith, if you and I do not engage with our faith, if you and I do not expect in faith, it also means that we can diminish our faith. And what happens is there is an unproductive and ineffective way of knowing God. Understand? So I just want to throw those points out to sort of set the foundation for this morning. And you know, sometimes we come to church and we think it's like the movies and we sit down and we just hear uh, a great speaker share a great sermon. But today, let's use the analogy of going into the gym. I know somebody got uh, hospitalized for going to a gym recently. (laughs) So Gorman got hospitalized recently for exercising too much. But let's use the analogy of the gym that we need to work out our faith this morning. Amen? We're here to work it out. We're not here to sit down and listen to a great preacher speak. But we need to exercise our faith this morning. And so I just want to invite us to come to gym this morning. And let's not keep scaling it over and only produce celebration without producing substance. Right? See, church happens to be a place that we produce celebration and it's great. Celebration is great, but sometimes we scale it over and we don't produce substance, right? So this morning, I want to invite us to pursue substance today as well as pursuing celebration. 
So what happens over a gradual period of time, if we are not careful, is we get disconnected with God's perspectives and we are no longer aligned with God's nature. And our faith begins to diminish. And we are no longer conquering our giants and no longer climbing mountains. Right? We just sort of kind of navigate around our circumstance. We just kind of navigate our, around our life. And we hope that God makes the way easy. See, faith makes things possible. It does not make things easy. Let me say that again. Faith makes things possible. It does not make things easy. And if our faith is not strong, we end up asking God to make it easy and we have lost the framework and the mindset of a fighter to be steadfast in times of shaking. Can I put it to you today that we need to have the framework and the mindset to have a faith that will fight? Faith makes things possible. It does not make things easy. See, and, but the, the challenge is this. Whatever inspires us may not necessarily be the same thing that su- sustains us. Make sense? Whatever inspires us may not be the same thing that sustains us. And we are so given to pursuing pleasure in society that we are numbed down to embrace the concept of the pursuit of pleasure that we neglect the pursuit of substance. So this morning, let's get ready to pursue substance. Amen? So are you guys spiritually healthy? And where's our heart and our emotions? And how's our spirit doing? How do we respond in faith when shaking comes? What is our response when you read the papers this morning? Or what is our response when you read about the news that's happening all over the world? When shaking happens, how do we remain steadfast, even when it is so intense? You see, we were never created to live out a life without God. Right? And there is a partnership that needs to take place for us to grow in faith. And we waver when we step into the attitude of believing for easy. We waver. When you and I think that faith is all about things that will be easy and plain sailing, we will waver when shaking happens. But we are called to be steadfast, to stand firm. And if you read the Bibles, I read scriptures of men who have been thrown into a den of lions and come out unscathed. We hear about stories of men who are thrown into furnaces of fire and come out not even smelling like smoke. We hear all these stories of what the men of faith have to go through. And this is the Bible that I read and this is the faith that I believe in and this is the faith that I want to grow to. I don't want life to be easy. Life is hard. But I know that I have a faith that will make things all possible. Right, And I, I know this for a fact that two people can go through exactly the same experience but they can have two different responses. You must under, understand that Saul faced Goliath. David also faced Goliath. But both came out with such differing responses. And we must refuse to allow ourselves to be de- defined by our circumstances just as Saul did. We should be defined by the external purposes of God. And we need to stop using faith as an excuse to ask God to make things easy. Our faith is not a component given to us to make life easy, but it's a component to require the kingdom of heaven to break into our lives. Cool? And wavering results when frustration and disappointment lessens the fire of God in our lives. Over the course of time, frustration and disappointment beats us down until we no longer have a fighter's attitude and faith. And we most of the time end up saying, God, just remove the giant, just remove the circumstances, just remove the mountains that I'm going through, just, just sort of like lay waste the value, lay waste my enemies, make it easy. And we have trained our faith to shut up and sit down if we allow our circumstances to take over. Friends, our faith has now been trained to not respond in strength and in steadfastness because we have trained it to shut shut up and sit down when every time a circumstance happens, we respond to the circumstance and not respond in faith. Right? So this morning, I really want all of us to sort of like work our muscle and work our faith. Amen? At the end of the day, the goal of Christianity is not to have an easy life. But the goal of Christianity is to be like Jesus each day. And how many of you know that God is calling us to maturity? And when shaking happens, we can either allow it to overcome us or we can grow from strength to strength, glory to glory, and maturity to maturity because of faith. Amen? There's a scripture in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 26 to 29, and I have that on the screen. 
Let's read this. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has a promise. He has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that, may, that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Verse 27, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Now, if you pay attention to this scripture, when God speaks, everything shakes. Right? The heaven and the earth will shake. Except for those things that are meant to remain. I wonder how many of us here in this room have ever made that prayer, God, speak to me. Speak to my life. Like, God, I need to hear your voice. God, I need to hear the plans that you have for me. God, I need to know which girl you want me to marry. God, I want to know which, which man you want me to marry. I mean, we always ask God to speak to us, right? But how many of you know that when God speaks to your life? You know, we always assume that it will be peaceful, calm, and then God will speak in a still, small voice in my heart, and there will be so much peace in my life, but... How many of you know when he speaks that he often causes things around us to shake? He often causes the things around us, he causes us to shake. And I have a sense that when God speaks into our life, there is a shaking that will take place before arresting. And God uses these moments to shake things up. And <laughs> truth be told, sometimes we need this shaking more than ever because we need God to speak into our life and unravel our lives. And I think so many times we come to God and ask Him to speak to us, to pull everything together, but God goes, you know what, I can't, I can't really put things together, I can't really assemble things together until I strip away things that I don't really want to be put together. You know, because if I assemble you with the pieces that you have right now, you're just going to end up looking like Frankenstein. Right? And there are times that God needs to remove things that we don't want in our lives or that He doesn't want in our lives so that He can piece together a future for us. And what God wants to do first before He creates the new you that you long for is to begin to pull off the old you so that the new you can emerge from within you. A new you that will remain steadfast when great shaking, shaking happens, understanding that the world that we live in is even more precarious than ever before. Right? And so, so many, so many times we come and say, God, speak to us, but how many of us know that we need to be prepared, be prepared to be matured by God? The Bible in many occasions talks about a shaking that will come. One that will shake both the heavens and earth. Haggai 2.7 talks about how all the nations will shake. If you read the scripture of Revelations, you know that there will be many shakings in the last days. Or even these days that we're living in. And sometimes when God speaks, He will begin to shake from our life things that we want to hold on. Especially the things that we want to hold on to. And when God speaks into our life, He begins to dismantle our dreams. I'm going to share my testimony in a bit, but you know, when we begin to ask God to speak into our life, He'll begin to dismantle things that you thought were so precious to you. Your career, your identity, your security, your relationships, the people around you. There, you can go through shaking and you will understand that God will want to tear everything apart because He doesn't want anything to hinder His love. And God says, you have to decide whether you want me to speak to you or do you want to remain as you are? It's a simple proposition. You can either remain as where you are today in faith or you say, God, speak to me so that I can mature in faith. Because whenever God speaks, He does two things at the same time. One, He begins to shake everything up in our lives and two, He matures us to keep us steadfast when greater shakings happen. And sometimes God allows us to experience what we consider a crash so that He can shake those things from our lives that were never supposed to be there so that we can experience the future that He has for us. He loves us so much. He's committed to remove everything that hinders love. You know, I, I, I grew up as a Christian and as a believer. My parents are fervent Christians. My dad worked full-time as a pastor in church. My mom worked full-time in the church in some form of capacity and both worked full-time in the church. 
uh, my grandmother, my grandparents are fervent Christians. My great grandparents were fervent Christians. They grew. I grew up in a very Christian environment, right? I think in, in my mother's womb, I would already memorize the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. Like, I came from a mission school. Uh, um, I won't say which mission school, but I came from a mission school, and high majority of them are Christians, right? So I'll go up as a primary school kid. I'll go up to my friends and say, "Hey, you're a Christian?" Uh? Then my friend would say, "Yes, I'm a Christian." Hey, what does this verse say? Then my friend would stare at me blankly because they wouldn't know, right? I say, wow, you call yourself a Christian, don't know this Bible verse. Oh, fuck life. Right? But, <laughs> so I used to be one of those like really annoying believer Christians uh, that everyone is heretic. <laughs> yeah. But, but, you know, that's, that's the sort of Christianity I grew up with. That's sort of the faith. I mean, I, I was one of those guys that was earmarked to be the heir apparent to take over the church at a, at a young age of two years old. You know, they, they kind of like, you know, I grew up in church. I was one of the leaders in church. I, as, even as a young person, I was worship leading at the age of 12 years old. You know, I was self leading. Wow, clap, clap. Yeah, thanks. Wow, thanks, 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 thanks. Right? But that was, what, that was the faith that I was living in. Right? And I would really memorize scriptures. You know, there's this um, party trick I used to do when I preached sermons, right? Uh, I would be able to mem- I, I'll memorize the books of the Bible in the sense of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I would memorize from Genesis all the way to Revelation. I'll speak at youth camps and I'll tell, like, okay, if anyone can beat me in saying Genesis to Revelation, you can read it off the Bible and I will do it in memory. If you can beat me in doing it faster, I'll buy you lunch. I've never lost. Never. So if anyone wants to challenge me later, I can do it in memory and you have to do it from Genesis, Exodus, like you read it out. It was, but that, that was sort of the Christianity I was living in for many, many years, right? Um, so at the age of, I was a youth pastor, uh, 25, 24, 25, yeah, and, and I was youth pastoring for about five years. And I remember that at about the age of 30, 31 years old, I was inside the prayer room in, in Burning Hearts Praying Room, right? And I sat down and then I saw a vision and it was a vision of a business and I, I quickly wrote, I, I wrote it down in my prayer room and then I was like, wow, this is, thus save the Lord, you know, I'm going to start a business, Right? Uh, lo and behold, within the next few days, I met counters of different people who says, oh my gosh, I heard that you wanted to do this. Like, you know, let's start a business. Then within like two, two weeks, I submitted my resignation letter to my senior pastor. I says, you know what? I think God is calling me to do something else. And so I started a business and that was like my journey and I felt like, wow, great. So at this point of time, at 31 years old, I thought I had a thriving youth ministry. The ministry was growing. It was solid. I was doing well in church. I was um, in the board of the church. I was the youngest board member, youngest speaker ever in the church, youngest, everything. Lah, right? You think about, like, this is where I was at the age of 31 years old. And I started my business and I left full-time ministry. And so when I started and I left full-time ministry, I started a cafe. In one and a half years, to cut a very long story, I lost, the biz- I lost money in the business. I lost almost all my savings. In fact, all my savings. And I sold the cafe back to the business owners one and a half years later. So this was in June 2012. 2013? June 2013. Oh, 2014. June 2014. Six months... Oh, yeah, 2014. I got married in 2014. So three months before getting married in 2014, my wife, to be my fiancé at that point of time, looked at me in June. We got married in September. She says, John, I don't think I can get married to you. Because the finances that I have... You know, you lost all your money in a business. You lost all your savings in a business. She looks to me and she says, I don't think I can get married to you. If you can lose your money like that, how can I trust my life in your hands? This was three months to getting married. So you must be understand, during that one and a half years of running that business, it was pretty intense. So I wasn't able to, to be as active in church as I used to be. So whatever happened to my speaking engagements, I, the, my pastor said, like, look, I can't, Ross, I said, that's fine. Right? I wasn't able to do a lot of things in church that I used to do. I handed over my youth ministry to other leaders. But what happened was communication was really poor. And so I, everyone thought that I abandoned, I abandoned sheep and sheep. Right? They literally like, oh, this guy go and, you know, chow already, then, you know, leave all these younglings to suffer and die. <laughs> Everything that I felt I built upon my identity and security was lost like that. So I placed a lot of my identity, I placed a lot of my security on my ministry, my, the platform that was given to me. We were running successful youth conferences. We were doing all these things. And a lot of the reputation and success I placed on my, my life was gone instantly. I lost money. I lost pride. Can you imagine when you start a cafe? At the, in those days, it was like, wow, so cool, cafe owner, eh? so hipster. <laughs> very common, very common. 
I count my his, my hipsterdom to my wife. But can so this was what I lived with. Like, and my pride, everything was like down to the drains. And it was almost at rock bottom when my wife looked at me, or my wife to be at that time looked at me, she says, I don't think I can get married to you. I don't know if I can. And this was well to buy C Leo, right? You know, that's it, right? So this was in June. So never mind, we had a Burning Hearts conference in that month, in July. And the team was incredibly understanding, right? Going up, knowing what I was going through, they were incredibly understanding. And they says, hey, John, I know you're extremely busy. Why don't you don't really plan so much for the conference? You know, I used to be either chairing, I used to be either like, you know, doing all these different things. So I, you know what, just, just, just be a driver, lah, since you're the only one with a car. So be the driver. So I says, okay, lah. I'll be the driver for the conference. So I was the driver for the conference. The only thing that I was going to do for the entire conference was to drive speakers, right? The only guy with the car, right? So drive. And so I remember the day before the conference, we were going to... Uh, Jay Thomas, the worship leader, has, was in Singapore and he was spending the whole day doing the touristy thing. He was at Marina Bay. And so uh, Mel and I had a PMC that evening. And that's why we were not able to meet them. I think we were John and Jane in the house for dinner. Um, and we were going to pick up the speaker from, from City Hall. And so I drove my car to City Hall, and we were waiting for them at City Hall, at Raffles City. Only job I had to do was to be a driver, just because the only thing I have left is a car. I parked the car at City Hall, basement two, and I waited for Jay Thomas to come. And they were like, oh, Jay is ready, like you can pick him up at Marina Bay Sands. So I went to my car, turned on my engine. The car couldn't start. And my car broke down. It was more dramatic than that. I was like, literally, can you imagine? So you must understand where I'm at, right? So sold my business in June. My wife to, sold with no money. Like, basically gave away my business, lost money. My fiancé tells me that she doesn't think she can get married to me. The only thing that, was, that I had in my life was like, okay, at least I'm the driver of the conference. I'm not chairing the conference. I wasn't going to do anything in the conference but to be a driver. And okay, fine, at least I'm going to be a driver. And I turned on my car and it couldn't switch on. So I remember sitting down at the, you know, where all the car, you know, the, the, where the wheels sort of like prevent. So I sat down and I started weeping in the Raffles City basement two car park. I was weeping and no one was with me, right? I think Mel, I don't, oh, she, oh so what happened was Mel went back home first to get another car because she bought her dad's car. But because my car couldn't start, I was weeping and I was just waiting for the tow truck to come. And I was like, God, what are you doing with my life? What are you doing? And I realized that all the identity security that I placed in in the seemingly seeming success, everything was stripped away. Stripped away to the core. And I remember attending conference, long story short, and another time I'll tell you, but God did a massive, amazing thing during the conference and He spoke directly to my heart. But I believe that was the start of a restoration of what it means that God is after my heart. And He was shaking everything in, my, in my, every fragment of my bones for him to speak to me directly to my heart. And he says, John, I really love you. And I want to hinder everything. Like the, the, the course of life that you're taking will cause you more harm than, do, than, than any good. And he was willing to stop me in my tracks so that he can pour his love into my heart. And that's what shaking does to us. And I believe that where I'm at today is just because of his love that was poured out into my heart. And you see, the best way to travel fast and to move forward with God is to let Him shake loose everything He doesn't want in your life so that you can move forward and receive everything that He has waiting for you. To receive everything that can never be shaken. See, in Hebrews 12, 28, it says this, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. We have access to things that is unshakable. But you see, many times we are like my old me where we place a lot of our faith and dependency on things that we can do on our own. The identity that we placed over ourselves because of what people think, our reputation, our success, our seemingly success. All these things we, we, we place our pedestal on, but these are things that can be shaken. And God wants to remove these things so that He can place us and put our faith on things that are unshakable. So in Hebrews 12, 28, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So what are things that cannot be shaken? Right, I've got four things that I put up that cannot be shaken that I would want to encourage all of us to place our faith on. Right? You guys cool? 
The four things that cannot be unshaken. Number one, and the throne of God cannot be shaken. Right? In Psalms 45 verse 6, it says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. Lamentations 5.19 says, You, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures from generation to generation. And we can praise God no matter what else happens because His throne is, it remains secure. It's unshakable. What does the Bible mean when it talks about God's throne? There are two things that I suggest to you. Number one, the throne represents God's kingship. It means His rule, His reign will last forever and ever and ever. Just like how the verse in Lamentations put it, you, O Lord, reign forever. You must understand this. God is forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. God. He's forever. He's Alpha and Omega from beginning till the end. The throne also represents God Himself. The throne will never be shaken and God will never be shaken. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will never be shaken. They're continually constant. The only one true thing that will never be moved the only being that will never be moved is God Himself. Hebrews 1, 10 and 12 says this, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear, all wear out like garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed. But you remain the same and your years will never end. God is eternal and unchangeable. Number two, the second thing that cannot be shaken, the Word of God. There's a very familiar passage in Mark chapter 13. It says, Heaven and earth will pass, but His Word will remain. First Peter 1.25 says, The Word of the Lord stands forever. God's Word, like Himself, is not created and it will remain forever. It is unchangeable. You know what? We can try to change it. People have tried to manipulate it. But at the end of the day, we will discover that our efforts are in vain because the Word of God will never be shaken. The Bible is living and powerful and eternal. There are three components to the Word of God that I will also bring to you. Number one, its power cannot be shaken. The power of the Word cannot be shaken. Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the Word of God is living and active. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. There is power in the Word of God. Today, this morning, we're joking about like, how, why am I preaching today? And I'm saying, oh, I'm just going to read a verse in the Bible and then I'll sit down. Thus saith the Lord. In the days of Jesus, this is what He did. He went up to the temple, He unscrolled the scripture and He read a scripture and it convicted hearts. When was the last time we read a scripture in the Bible and it cuts us to the heart? Right, we read it like it's a story, we read it, but this is true. When it says in Colossians that He is the image of the invisible God, all things were created, things in heaven and earth, visible, invisible, all was created. We read it and do we actually understand that God is sitting on the throne room right now? Right? This is what the Bible says. The Bible says that we need to go to the ends of the earth to bring the gospel, like, do we read it and do we like, hmm, that's a nice thought. And we go back to our lives as usual. When was the last time you read the scripture, heard the scripture, and it convicts us? When was it? The word of God has power to convict, to convert, and to cleanse, and to comfort, and to counsel. Oh, five C's. The power of God cannot be shaken. Its promises cannot be shaken. It's been estimated that there are more than 30,000 estimated promises in the scripture ranging uh, from all sorts of different promises that God will never leave us, never forsake us, the promise of holy and righteous, you know, so many promises, 30,000 promises. He is going to remain faithful to all of them. Every single promise. There's a promise in Philippians chapter 2 that he will keep it and he will hold it. It says that, at the end of the day, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's a promise. He says it. Every knee will bow. It doesn't seem like it now, but it's a promise that he'll hold and he'll keep. The third P of this three, well, C5, C3 Ps, I'm on a roll. Its prophecies cannot be shaken. I think Andre has this cool math thing that he does of like one of a hundred, of a zero, of a I don't know what, 
of all the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled and He fulfilled them all, right? His prophecies, all prophecies will be fulfilled in the Scripture. All. How, how much do we love the Scriptures today? Do we long to read or listen to the Word of God? Do we allow it to convict us and cleanse us? Have we allowed the Word who became flesh, Jesus Christ, to take control of our lives? Third point of whatever is unshaken is the church of God cannot be shaken. The word of God in Matthew 16, 18, and it's quite a familiar scripture, it says that I will build my church and the gates of Hades, Hades will not overcome it. The church as an organization, the, phys- the physical church that we see now as an organization, we see it, it can be shaken. But there's a promise in the Bible that the bride of Christ will be with Christ forever and ever. The whole body of believers as the body of of Christ, as the bride of Christ, is one that will remain forever and ever and will remain steadfast. And what a blessing it is to know that we are members of that body. The physical church will wilt away, but the bride of Christ will stand forever. And I want us to think of a, a bigger perspective than what we can imagine. I love the local church, but there's beyond the local church, there's a bride of Christ that God is longing for. And He's looking for a bride that is mature and spotless. Right? I just want to paint a global perspective, an eternal perspective to the idea of the bride of Christ that will remain steadfast. How many of us are part of that body? We are part of that body. Unfortunately, we tend to criticize each other but we love the bride of Christ. Amen. Lastly, the child of God cannot be shaken. And there are many wonderful promises in the Word of God regarding regarding this. It's 1 John 2.17. It says, The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. In John 10.28, it says, Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. There's a passage in Romans 8 that I really love. It says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is Christ Jesus our Lord. See, as believers, we have eternal life and we can remain steadfast. For Christ is our strength and He cannot be shaken. And we shall dwell in the eternal inheritance in that city whose architect and builder is God. See, you and I, we can be living in precarious times and we can be living in times that seem so shakeable. But what does it mean for us to remain steadfast? Today, when we walk out of this room, where are we placing our faith on? What is our response in times of shaking? One of my favorite verses in, in the Bible is in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, since we are also surrounded by a, great, uh, a cloud of great witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which is so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. In some versions, it says the author and the perfecter of our faith. So every time I read this scripture and I've been studying this, this verse and always different pockets of this verse would, would, would speak to me. But every time I read this verse or lately I've been reading this idea of what the Bible means when he says that Jesus is the perfect author, he starts our faith, but the perfecter of our faith. Does that mean there's such a thing as a perfect faith? I don't know. I, I wrote down my notes. Is there such a thing? I, 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 I have not found the answer to that question. But can I suggest to you that there is a start point of our faith, but there's also an end point of our faith, a maturing point of our faith. There's a faith that God beckons our faith to reach a level of maturity. And so I, even as I was preparing this sermon, a question came to me. It says, what does a mature faith look like? Do you and I have a mature faith? What does it mean to have a mature faith? In times of testing, in times of shaking, what is our response? The maturity of our faith dictates the response that we give. Can I suggest to you in Hebrews chapter 12, just before Hebrews 12, 11 gives us a clue of what a mature faith looks like. 
So Hebrews 11 has this, they call it the hall of faith, right? They talk about all these characters in the Bible who were extremely good, strong, gave up their lives, they full of faith, etc., etc. But this was a scripture that I feel gives us the confidence to Hebrews chapter 12. So the writer says, And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, all these characters who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouth of lions, quenched the fury of flames, and escaped the edge of the sword. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put into prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were put to death by the sword. These were all commended for their faith. Then it starts in Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, understanding that there is a Jesus who starts our faith, but also matures our faith. What does a mature faith look like? In Revelation 12, 11, there's this verse. And it, this verse is a powerful verse. If you want to know more about this verse, Jason will be preaching on it during conference, Burning Hearts Conference, so site publicity. <laughs> Burning Hearts is having our conference. St. Andrew's Cathedral. You can either uh, feed the flesh and attend a wedding that Tom has, or we can listen to God. <laughs> just, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Revelations 12 verse 11, it says this. They, talking about us people, overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. That is a mature faith. That when testing comes, we are able to say yes to God. So this morning... How many of us can say yes to God, understanding that He wants to mature our faith and understanding that He wants to test our faith? He wants us to examine our faith. Can we still say yes to God in that circumstance? Can we say yes to God and believe that He is a good God? You know, I read Genesis chapter 1 and He created the heavens and the earth. He created the seas. He, He did all these wonderful things and every creation that happened, He says, oh, this is good. This is good. He created men and women, he says, this is very good, right? There's this concept of good that God presents to us. But the enemy would try to tell us, hey, 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 you know what? You need to find out your definition of good and evil. Why don't you eat this fruit? Then you can decide for yourself what is good. See, what happens is the greatest thing that the enemy is doing to us is giving us this idea or thought or perception that we can decide what is good and evil. It's a deception. But God says that this is good. And how many of us today can say yes to God knowing that He is a good God? How many of us can say that yes to His leadership? So even as I get the band to come up this morning, Hebrews 12 talks about how He wants to perfect our faith. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. And I take great comfort in this, that he wants to partner with us. The Bible in Hebrews 12 didn't say that, okay, okay, John, you need to to do everything in your own power to build your own faith. There are scriptures that talk about how we need to work out our faith. There are scriptures in the Bible that says that we need to make every effort to add to our faith. But I read Hebrews 12, 1, 2, and I know that God is in the business of perfecting my faith, which means that he wants to partner with us to grow our faith. And I take comfort knowing that the supreme God who sits upon the throne room on heaven is concerned about my faith. He is. Psalms 8.4, it says, this, what is meant that He is mindful of us, that He cares for us. See, when we say yes to God, we know that there is a shepherd who looks after us, who cares for us, who loves us. And he'll do whatever it takes to make sure that there's nothing that can hinder love. And he's in the business of maturing our faith. So today, this morning, you might feel like your faith is wavering. You might feel like there is 
I can't trust God. I can't trust my circumstance. The situations that you're going through, you might think is the most challenging that you're ever going to go through in your life. But our response to this is, God, I say yes to you because you are a good God, because you are awesome and powerful. And my picture is this. When all of us seated in this room begin to understand that we have a faith in God that is supreme and powerful and wonderful, guess what? We're going to live our lives differently than we are leading our lives now. People's going to ask us, why do you have that faith in this God? Like, the economy is doing so bad. You don't have a girlfriend yet? You're single? Like, oh, I mean, whatever you're going through. But what would it look like when all of us understand that our faith can be strong and mature and understand that we can put our faith on things that are unshaken, which is God, that our lives would be so different than we are leading it today. And it starts from a yes. It starts from a willingness in our hearts. It starts from obedience to God. So this morning, I want us to respond by saying yes to God again. See, it's the little yeses that we have in our hearts that will be presented like an alabaster jar, you know? Can you imagine an alabaster jar and every time you say yes, you're putting a cup worth of perfume in that jar, a cup of, cup, you know? Every time you say yes to God again, you're just putting a little bit more of a drop into that jar. And every time you're saying yes and being obedient to God, you're adding into that jar. But there'll come a point where there will be a tipping point that you know that you can break the jar because your faith has now been matured because of the constant yeses that you say in your heart in obedience to Him. Then Revelations 12, 11 can happen, that we can give up our lives then we know that there's a maturity in our faith that when it requires us to say the big yes, we can. We know that because of our obedience in the heart, when a tremendous shaking happens, we will, we will remain steadfast because of the little yeses that we make now. A little yes can be as simple as, you know, you want to watch something that you shouldn't, but you say, God, I'm going to stand in faith. I'm going to pull out the scriptures and I'm going to declare scriptures over my life. A simple yes can be as simple like there is an ama selling tissue in the hawker center, but I want to take and take a step in faith and just speak to her and just tell her that God loves her. That is a simple yes. All these little yeses adds up. So this morning, how many of us want to say yes to God again? I'm going to give us an opportunity to respond. I'm going to get the band to sing a song and we're going to all stand up and we're just going to worship. But if you feel this morning that you want to respond and say yes to God again, even despite the challenges that you're going through, even despite the failings and the shortcomings that you've had, maybe you have said yes 10 years ago and in the last 10 years you realize that you have not led a life of faith. Even if in the last six months you know that there's so many things that were in the way, circumstances that were going through it prevented you from saying yes and being obedient to God fully, it doesn't matter. Because our weak yes means everything to God. I'm going to share one more story before I invite all of us to stand up. I love this. I love this. And so you must remember this was a year ago, and a year before I got married, I proposed to my wife. Now, every time you make a proposal, you'd always dream the most romantic thing that will happen. Someone's going to cry. The, the wife, the fiancé is going to be like, oh my gosh, he proposed. Cry, weep, and give you a loving embrace. And we have all these pictures. And I remember when I proposed to Mel, good-sized diamond, great idea. Oh, like, confirm we'll cry one, right? You know, so I went back to the place that we talked about how, you know, we should pray about whether we should get together. Went back to the same place, more got memory, you know? Gamtong kind of feels moment, right? And I pro- <laughs> went down on one knee. Will you marry me? She looked at me and she laughed. <laughs> For 20 seconds, she laughed. I was like, wow. You know, like, wow. All the, the dashes of all the dreams of the dream proposal went down the drain. And in her giggles and her laugh, she mustered whatever she could say and she said a very like, uh, yeah. 
broke every dream that I had of a dream proposal. Hey, why you laugh so hard? Later, yeah. But I can tell you something that uh, Yah meant the world to me. In her week, yes, it moved my heart. Yeah. Come on. But why am I saying this today? To mind you, today you might think that your, your yes is super weak. You might think that you have no capabilities. You might think you have no strength. You might think that you have nothing to give to God. But let me tell you something, your weak yes will move his heart.